Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to get started in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12 through 18. We'll finish the chapter today, at least I anticipate to. Uh, Tony's got some notes coming for you. Uh, Paul is in chapter 10, 11, 12, is he's uh, doing two things. He's defending his ministry, but also attacking the false teachers. We've seen this coming all the way through the Corinthian letters, all the way through 2 Corinthians. But now he's going to kind of identify what they're doing, what their motive is. And they're, basically this, this chapter, at least the end of this chapter, is going to come down to this. is He's going to be blaming them for moving in on his territory. Paul's going to appear to claim, and we'll look at the notes and then go through this, appear to justify himself. I think he's referring to the Jerusalem Council when he went down from Antioch and met at the Jerusalem Council in 48 AD. And they were questioning Paul and his ministry, the the apostles of the Lord, if it be James, Peter, John, James, Jesus' brother, and John and Peter, it's kind of like, well, what are you preaching? I mean, are you, you're, you're, you're dismissing the Jewish law and you're just preaching Christ. And Paul says, exactly. And he explained to him, Peter had a similar experience in Caesarea where he was preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ and not just presenting Jewish culture and Jewish law. And so that at the end, we'll take a look at that in the book of Acts. Uh, James wrote a letter from the Jerusalem Council and sent it with Paul as a letter of recommendation that he was accepted by the apostles from Jerusalem with the correct message. And he went up to Antioch, read it there, went back to the Galatian churches, and they also recognized that he was an apostle called to go to the Gentiles. So in a, in a sense, if you want to look at it, it may be too... Uh, uh, what do I saw? Too organized for us to accept that the early church was this organized. But it's as if the headquarters of Christianity, Jerusalem, which today some would call as Rome, you know, the Pope or whatever, they recognized Paul as a legitimate apostle, and they recognized his ministry to the Gentiles. And you remember the verse, he's an apostle to the Gentiles, just like Peter was called to the Jews. So it's like, oh, they're going to be slightly different, but they both got the same message. So he had a letter that he could, he could, he, he, he could carry it with him in a sense. A letter from James, Jesus' brother, from Jerusalem saying, we recognize Paul's message, we recognize Paul's ministry, we recognize his apostleship, and we recognize he's a minister to the Gentile lands, and Paul would have that authority. So he has come into the Corinthian church. Remember, there was no Corinthian church. He came into a synagogue in Corinth spoke about the Messiah from the text of the Old Testament scriptures to the synagogue in Corinth, and it split the synagogue. Some of them, including the synagogue leader who lived next door to the synagogue, he started having church services, Christian services, in his house, and the synagogue continued meeting. The Jews got mad at Paul, and they had a little riot and stuff, and they appealed it to court, and it was thrown out of the court, and we read all that. Uh, but it, he started a Corinthian, the Corinthian Christian Church. And now he started other churches, and he's got leadership set up. But now the issue is some people have come from the outside, have come into that church, and have begun to use that church for several reasons. One, they have to dis discredit Paul. They've got to get Paul, no, 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 no. And they've been discrediting Paul, which then puts them in a position of leadership. But they had nothing to do with the starting of that church. They've got nothing to add to that church. Paul is not against working with other ministries. He talks in 1 Corinthians about... He planted in Apollos' water. So him and Apollos are on the same page. Paul planted the seed and moved on. Apollos came and watered that seed, and God made it grow. So Paul's all about working with other ministries. He also talks about him having laid, in chapter 3 of 1 Corinthians, he says, I laid a foundation as an expert builder, and someone else is building on it. He wasn't opposed to other believers, other Christians, other apostles, other teachers coming in and building on the foundation he laid. The foundation he laid was Jesus Christ. And now there's a lot of things, we know there's a lot of, once you're saved, there's a lot of things to build on that structure of your salvation as far as understanding and growth. But he says, but he also in that verse says, but each one must be careful how he builds. You can't lay a different foundation. He says, if I've laid the correct foundation, you can build on that foundation, but be very careful and definitely don't over and lay another foundation. So he's, he's having trouble with people coming in, in a sense, piggybacking on his ministry now, he's not against people adding to his ministry, adding to the Word of God, or not adding to the Word of God, but teaching the people the Word of God. But he is against those who come in because they can't make it, in a sense, on their own, come into his established church, 
discredit him, start teaching their own doctrine, and lead the people back into paganism. Say, look what we got. And it's like, Paul, that's where Paul's at with the Corinthian church. Someone, Apollos hasn't come in and started teaching more about the Old Testament, explain, explain, explaining the New Testament doctrine. Some false teachers, some false apostles have come in, and they began to lead the people astray. They're still calling it a church. They're discrediting Paul. Oh, no, no, he didn't know what he was doing. And they're taking the people where they want to go. Now, you have your notes. If you look at the page, these are continuation of last week's notes and the week before. So it's page four and page five. If you look at the bottom of page five, uh, who are these false teachers? We do not know specifically who these false teachers are, but we do know uh, we can build a case for it. We do know certain things about what Paul says about them. Uh, very quickly, there's six things we can identify about these false teachers that have come into the church. And Paul is giving them no credit. He's not saying, well, you know, help them along or help instruct them. It's a, he's saying, get rid of them. He talks about when I come, I will punish them. These are the people he's going to punish. He's not going to correct them. He's going to get rid of them. He's going to drive them out. And so one of them, what, number one, they're intruders from the outside. They are not necessarily people in the church, but they're intruders from the outside. Number two, they claim superior authority. Three, it appears they, they're Judaizers, uh, libertines, or in a sense they're very liberal in, in as far as holding to Christian ways, and they're kind of combining, uh, what would we call them out of, uh, out of Revelation? Uh, what's, that? what's that? I'm thinking that I just can't think of the word. Uh, he was one of the early followers of, uh, of the book of Acts. Uh, you guys know what I'm talking about. What's that? Nicolaitans. Nicolaitans. Thank you. The Nicolaitans, they'd come in and they were more worldly, and they're saying you've got this extreme grace that you can no longer sin. It's like a hyper-spirituality. You can see this appearing in different forms now. But they come in and it's like, don't worry about living the Christian life. You're already saved. And they really kind of waters it down as far as separating from the world, as far as your, your, uh, your thinking and your behavior. Philosophers, we know that from other verses. They are some, maybe an early form of Gnostics. They're trying to combine Greek established, established Greek philosophy with Christianity and actually watering Christianity down so it matches philosophy so you don't have such a break with society that you can continue living in the Greek philosophy, the Greek society, and still be a Christian. It's like, no, that's not. We're leaving Greek philosophy and understanding a higher level of truth. And then, of course, they're seeking financial gain. And the reason for that, all those put together... Uh, we can assume possibly this. They've got some kind of authority coming from Jerusalem or claiming to have some kind of authority from Jerusalem. They've been working their way across uh, Asia. They're Judaizers. Since they're trying to get people back to the Jewish law. They're trying to undermine Paul. And, they're, and Paul's going to appeal to his authority from Jerusalem. And they're coming from the outside. They're, they're following Paul, trying to grab what Paul's done and use it for their own advantage. They do not have the ability to actually have created a church themselves. They don't have the ability to have established. They don't have the doctrine. They don't have the, 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 the word of God to do what Paul's done. But they do have the ability to come in, discredit Paul, and take over Paul's group and, 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 uh, and lead them astray for their own advantage. Number one, the intruders from the outside, from chapter 3, verse 1, he talks about using letters of commendation, meaning references from other churches. Or they use self-commendation. In other words, they commend themselves. You've seen this done before, of uh, people telling in stories all the great things that have been accomplished in their ministry. And I've been in certain groups where this is extreme, and they tell these wild stories that if they're true, my gosh, I mean, it's, you know, you're almost in one of the, the fourth member of the Trinity, and you've got such a powerful ministry. But it's like they're exaggerating stories with no way of checking them out. These people are doing the same thing, exaggerating their previous behavior. They're, wow, we want that in our church. And they invade another man's territory, and that's what we're going to talk about. Paul is saying, Corinth is my territory. And they're coming in, not watering the seed, not building on the foundation Paul's laid. Now, again, Paul's not against someone watering the seed he's planted or building on the foundation he's laid. These people are coming in, digging up Paul's seed, destroying the foundation, and taking over. They're taking over another man's territory. Uh, they claim to be super, uh, a, a superior authority in chapter 11, verse 5. We're going to see they're referred to as super apostles which gives the impression, especially when you get down to the Judaizing part, that they're coming out of Judea, out of Jerusalem. They must know somebody. And remember, not everyone in Jerusalem is Paul's friend. Okay, Paul's, Paul's 
uh, if you go back to the days before he was a believer, he offended all the Christians and was on the side of the Pharisees and the high priest. Then he becomes a Christian, and then he, so he offends the high priest, he offends the Pharisees, so now all the Jews, in a sense, are against him. And the Christians are kind of skeptical of him because he's not really uh, preaching you know, the Jew, Jewish message. He's preaching this new gospel about Christ, which, again, they agree with eventually. But then there are still, within the Christian community, those who are still holding to the Jewish law, and so there's, they're called the Judaizers. So you've got the Pharisees and the priests, Sadducees and the Pharisees against Paul. You get in the Christian community those who are still not completely broken away from the Jewish law against Paul. And you've got a handful of, of the uh, Christians who are still skeptical of Paul because he's, he's so involved in the Gentile religion or the Gentile culture that he sounds a lot like, if you go back to the days of, of the Maccabees, and they've, they've, the Jews having to fight against Antiochus, Epiphanes, and all this is like, and he, Paul's not circumcising. It's like, just, there's just, Paul doesn't have a lot of support. He's, he's just he's not necessarily offending a lot of people, but he's so straight to this, this, the, the gospel that there's not a lot of room for him to stand on. So these people are coming out of, number two, coming out of Jerusalem possibly. They, they claim to be super apostles. They despise Paul. And in chapter 11, verse 13, they're referred to as ministers of Satan. Which doesn't mean they sing with, you know, Ozzy Osbourne or, or something like this in some kind of rock group. They're actually ministers of some other gospel, but they are ministers of Satan. That's where Paul Wall is going to use. He says even saint appears as an angel of light. You don't have to be, you know, wearing horns and, and claiming to be a satanic follower to be a servant of Satan. And Paul's identifying these people who are undermining him as messengers or ministers of Satan. Um, Judaizers, the reasons for that is in chapter 11, verse 22, and a desire for them to restore the Jewish law to the people. Uh, philosophers, we know plenty of verses for that. And then seeking financial gain, that's kind of coming up in chapter 11, verse 12, that they are definitely trying to use the people that Paul's established together. Remember, wherever people are gathered together, there's some kind of power base. And so if you can somehow get in there and access those people, you're going to get power, you're going to get finances, you're going to have something. And so that's what Paul's church is being used for. So that's kind of what we're looking at here in chapter 10. Uh, as we wrap up chapter 10, verse chapter 11, it's going to, Paul's going to begin to, uh, if you look at chapter 11, verse 1, he says, I hope you'll put up with a little of my foolishness. In other words, he's going to slip into that. And he's telling you ahead of time, I'm going to slip into a little bit of self-promotion. And he's going to go through chapter 11 as basically self-promotion. And he's going to call it foolishness all the way along. Because this should not be what's impressing you. The word of God, your transformation, your relationship with Jesus Christ should be what's impressing you. But since you put up with fools, the false teachers, he says, let me just show you. I can play that card too. I can impress you with some foolish credentials. And he gives this whole list. That's going to be kind of exciting to go through uh, 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 as Paul identifies some things that we don't necessarily hear a lot about. Because Paul is talking a lot about some personal issues and personal experiences that really, to again, if you read, read chapter 11 and, and take it serious, this guy, this Paul, if he would take this, this story, this approach, and go to the modern Western church with all of these visions and all these spiritual experiences, people would line up for miles to hear this man speak or see him at a book signing because... But see, that's, but he says, that's not what's going to transform your life. The fact that I have seen things or God has called me to be an apostle or whatever vision I've experienced, he says, that's not going to transform your life. What's going to transform your life is the truth. And I'm here to present you the truth, not my own story. But again, as you know, I mean, it's pretty obvious, I think, in our culture, what sells is the great story, the great spiritual experience. And then you read that, you hear that, you see it on the big screen, big screen and then you want to have that same experience. It's like... It's vanity. It, it, there's no, no value in the experience. What the value is, is in the truth, the correct philosophy, the correct worldview. And Paul is trying to renew minds, bring people in line with Christ's reality so that you can grow in Christ and become like Christ. Oh, that sounds boring. Sounds like a lot of work. But this is, so that's what he says right here in chapter 11. I, I'll give you some foolishness. I, I'll give you the big screen. You want to see some Hollywood? I'll show you Hollywood. And that's kind of where he goes. And he apologizes at the end. He says, uh, I, I, you know, uh, Verse, chapter 11, verse 16, I repeat, let no one take me for a fool, but if you do, then receive me just as you would a fool, so that I may do a little boasting. In this self-confident boasting, I am not talking as the Lord would, but as a fool. 
Meaning I'm not talking to you as an apostle sent by the Lord. I'm talking to you like a fool trying to impress you, trying to entertain you. But he goes, well, and he goes on and says, since, since many are boasting in the way the world does, since many of these false teachers are doing this, I too will boast. If you want to compete, I'll drop down and compete at that level. Verse 19 of chapter 11, you gladly put up with fools since you are so wise, and that's a sarcastic statement. In fact, you even put up with anyone who enslaves you, inferring back to the, take them back to the law, or exploits you, comes in and gives you a big story just to make money, exploits you for their own expense, or takes advantage of you, or pushes himself towards you, or slaps you in the face. I mean, you're being abused by these false teachers. He says, how come? He says, okay, he says, I'll drop, he says, you'll put up with me being a fool, I know, because you're, you're even willing for false teachers to come in and abuse you, and you're, you're willing to put up with that. And he says, let's get past that. Then it goes on, what anyone dares to boast about, and I'm speaking as a fool, I also dare to boast about. Are any of them Hebrews? And then verse 22, he begins to talk about all. He says, they say they're this, I'm more. They say they've worked hard, I've worked harder than all of them. He says, you give me any of these criteria, show me one of their letters, and I'll, I'll outdo their letter. I can outdo everything they've ever done. And that's where chapter, and then he gets all done, he apologizes, and he says, that's not the point. I, he says, I'm embarrassed I even did that. But, I, but again, you can see his heart is for the people. He says, I'll do this just so you'll stop and go, really, Paul, you've, all that has happened to you? Yes, but it's of no advantage to you, except if you'll pay attention, let's get back to the text. So, chapter 10, we're going to go back to that. I'm going to read into it and pick up teaching right around in verse 12. And you've got your notes there, starting in well, page 4, chapter 10, verse 12. I'm going to read through this chapter so you kind of hear the text as we move into it. And uh, remember, chapter 1 through 7, Paul is talking about the relationship between him and the Corinthians have been restored as Titus has come. So he's talking about the relationship. There's still some outsiders in the church that need to be isolated. But the church as a whole, after Titus has been there, has seen their error and has come back to the apostolic doctrine. Chapters 8 and 9, Paul's talking about coming back. And since they're back on track, they're a functioning church. He's going to come back and collect the money to take to the Jerusalem saints because he's got a bigger plan that we're all going to be working together to bring the Christians together with the Jewish Christians. And then chapter 10, he breaks away from the relationship with the Corinthian church, breaks away from the gift that he's talking about collecting for the Jerusalem saints. And in chapter 10, 11, and 12, it's now, okay, we're going to isolate, uh, almost like give chemotherapy to these false teachers and just, just destroy them in the church. So this is, this is, this is the beginning of the punishment for those who have not repented. Chapter 10, verse 1. By the meekness and gentleness of Christ, I appeal to you, I call, whom timid when face to face with you, but bold when away. He's, you know, he's going to come in and, you know, I'm, I'm begging you, but there's going to be harshness coming. I beg you that when I come, I may not have to be as bold as I expect be towards some people who think that we live by the standards of this world. And again, we're going to see this coming up in these verses today. There's a standard. These, these false teachers want to create their own standard of success. And Paul says, that's not the standard. It's the standard the Lord sets, and the Lord is going to do the evaluation. The human standard is down here, whatever you want to call the human standard. It may be, you know, people's enthusiasm. It may be the attendance. It may be how much money was raised. It may be how many people showed up for some activity. Whatever it is, it's like whoever has the biggest entourage that shows up and has the biggest people carrying. I've seen people have people, they come in and speak, someone carries their Bible for them. It's like, it's like some great you know, spiritual guru has come to town. It's like, come on. And that's what they, that's the human standard. It's like, oh, aren't you impressed? The lights come on and off and they use the sound effects and it's like the smoke. It's like, oh, this is God. It's like, yeah, he's, he's saying that right here. He says, uh, I beg you that when we, I come, I may not have to be as bold as I expect towards some people who think we live by the standards of this world. That's going to come up later. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. And now he's going to talk about the issue is the thinking. What is in your mind? What you believe? Your f true philosophy. The weapons we fight with. Indeed, we have weapons. Paul's got weapons. But they're not weapons of, in the physical sense. And here's the going to describe. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds or fortresses or prisons. We demolish, now here, what are those strongholds? Arguments and every pretension, that's a pride, a lofty thing, that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. We're destroying those things that are set themselves above the truth of God, the false philosophies. We're destroying and ripping those down, proving them false, replacing them with a true understanding. We take, uh, it sets up against knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. 
and we will be ready to punish every act of disobedience once your obedience is complete. Once you've had a chance to transform and everyone's had a chance to evaluate, we'll come in and punish those. And that's, again, we talk about that. What is that punishment? It's probably isolation. It's probably getting them out of fellowship with the rest of the believers. You know, he's not going to chain them to a wall and beat them or shoot them or execute them. That, that's not the weapon. We're going to just isolate them. Again, that's something that can be discussed as we go. Then he says in verse 7 to the Corinthians, you are looking only on the surface of, of things. If anyone is confident that he belongs to Christ, he should consider again that we belong to Christ just as much as he. So now you begin to see there's a comparison taking place here. You're evaluating people only on the surface. And when someone comes in and says they're a believer, they're, they belong to Christ, he says you've got to understand, so do we. And if they who belong to Christ are presenting a truth that's different than our message, then you've got to make a decision. We both can't be right. He says, they say they belong to Christ, but understand, if they belong to Christ, I'm the one who started the church. I belong to Christ. So which one of us is telling you the truth? He should be considered again that we belong to Christ just as much as he. For even if I boast somewhat freely about the authority the Lord gave, gave us for building you up rather than tearing you down, I will not be ashamed of it. In other words, the authority and that, that authority comes into the idea that the Lord called him to be an apostle, but also we're going to get into the Jerusalem Council in 48 AD. Paul went down and was called in. Paul's just not a, a loose cannon out doing what he wants to. He was called in and willingly appeared before James, the pastor in Jerusalem, uh, John, Peter, the other apostles, the followers of Christ that knew Christ, as, because Paul never knew Christ in the flesh. He appeared to the apostles and explained his message. There was some argument. There was some debate. Even Peter, who was the one who, who was in Caesarea, was in, in uh, Cornelius' house, and saw the Spirit come down on the Gentiles without them being circumcised, and he was in the house of a Gentile eating food with the Gentiles, completely violating the Jewish law, saw the Spirit move on these people. He had gotten called in on the carpet. He says, what are you doing, Peter? And he explained, this is, well, we can't argue with God. Well, by the time Paul's in the same position, Peter switched sides and is back to the Judaizer side and is kind of arguing with Paul. Now, that's going to come up later in the Galatian book. But the point being, he's got authority, not just from God, but he's been approved by James, Peter, John. His, he's called in and they've discussed it and was sent away with in a letter of approval that we've got a copy of in the book of Acts. For even if I boast somewhat freely about the authority, that's the authority I'm talking about, the Lord gave us for building you up rather than pulling you down. We're going to come in and we've got authority to build you up in Christ. I will not be ashamed of it. In other words, I, I sometimes sound like, well, you know, I've got letters, I've got approval, the Lord's called me to be apostle. I'm kind of bold about my ministry and it may get a little annoying, but he says, I've got to hang on to that because that's your salvation, that's your growth. If you dismiss me, Paul, he's saying, where are you going to go to the false teachers? I will not be ashamed of it. I do not want to seem to be trying to frighten you with my letters. I'm not trying to scare you. I'm trying to save you, continue your growth. For some say his letters are weighty and forceful, but in person he is unimpressive and his speaking amounts to nothing. I and mean, we've talked about that. Such people should realize that what we are in our letters when we are absent, we will be in our actions when we are present. When we show up, we can, we can produce what we said. He said, I, I'm not, you know, just because I come in and I'm cooperative and, I, and I, I'm not following all the great lingua, or rhetoric skills of, in, you know, impressing people, I, I can come in and play that game. Verse 12, we do not dare to classify or compare ourselves with some who commend themselves. Now, why, this is where he's making a comparison again. His ministry with the false teacher's ministry. We do not dare to classify or compare ourselves with some who commend themselves. When they measure themselves by themselves or compare themselves with themselves, they are not wise. In other words, Paul, Paul's basically saying, if, you, if you're willing to accept this right here, Paul's saying, I'm up here. I've been called by God. I'm an apostle. I've got approval from the Jerusalem Council from John, James, Peter, although that doesn't come up specifically here. He does have that approval. Then you've got these false teachers come in, and they're down here, and they've got their own standards, and they, they set the bar right here. This is, this is the measure of success right here, and all the people then down here, whatever. And, and, and their, sign, their sign of success would be whatever their criteria is. It's, it involves self-promotion. It involves all the things the world would admire, you know, including nice dress and a nice entourage and and letters of recommendation, and good reviews in the magazines, and high attendance, and, and big buildings, and offerings are up, and, and all this. And Paul says, 
yeah, I don't dare compare myself to these for two reasons. One, I'm dropping down to the wrong standard. And number two, if I start saying, well, these are what I'm doing, these things up here, I'm doing this, I'm teaching Christ, I'm, I'm in line of the Old Testament. It, it's like this is so far above their understanding that they can't, they're not impressed with this. Do you understand what I'm saying here? It's like, oh, how, I mean, I'm trying to think of an example. It's like someone who is, a, a, I'll just use an example of like a, a fifth grader or a sixth grader who watches football. Now, I, I teach sixth grade and seventh graders. And so I hear them talking about sports, like professional sports. If it be football or basketball, I know a little bit more about basketball. I know a lot more about basketball than football. But you hear them talking, and what they're impressed with is, you know, a lot of fluff. You know, who's got the coolest commercials? Who's got the biggest sponsors? Who gets the most publicity? Who's on the cover? Whoever the magazines say is impressive, that's who they're impressed with. And, you know, that's how, that's how culture works right now. Who's ever, you know, the celebrities come and go. It's the end of the, end of the year. New Year's Eve is coming. New Year's is coming. And so we're going to have a year in review. Who's all the celebrities? Who left a mark on 2015? Right. A, a good majority of those who left a mark on 2015 did not leave a historical mark. They left a memory implant, imprint in people's minds. Like, oh, it's going to become a trivial question. I mean, look what, who left an impression in the 70s and the 80s? There's so many people that have come and gone. And, and so what I'm trying to say is here, is when a, when a child sometimes looks at a sports figure, it's like they don't understand the game. They don't understand the stats. They don't understand what really makes a great team. And Paul is up here. He's up here at the collegiate coaching level. He's up here at the level of a team manager, at, at the professional level. And what's impressing people down here is magazine covers. And who's got the coolest commercials? And who's got the sponsors? What's impressing Paul is who can put the numbers on the board? Who can bring this team together? It may be a player that is not getting any press, but he's the backbone of the team. He's the one who's in the locker room holding things together. Or he's the one who's got the assist. Or he's the one who's, who's, who's doing the rebounding, kicking the ball out to the great superstar who's pouring the points in. And so Paul is talking here and says, I don't dare compare myself, one, because now I'm down here comparing magazine covers. It's like, that's not the point of the ministry. And if I do start naming off what I think is impressive, you don't have the ability to understand, as a fifth grader, what's really required to be a manager of a team. I've seen kids, and you know, you have too. And back in the day when they used to have cards, you know, sports cards, they're kind of come and gone, I think. I was really big in baseball cards for a while. My wife understands this. We don't have them anymore. But uh, there was a time I was still a married child. I was married and still a teenager. But uh, I've grown up some. We're still, we're, still, we're still working on it. We're still working on it. <laughs> but uh, but they'll, they'll be laying their cards down. And they got, now listen, all these guys are professional players. They're all making money. I mean, not just thousands, but sometimes millions of dollars. And they'll be laying cards down. Oh no, that guy stinks. He's no good. And they start ridiculing this, this player. And it's like, do you even, you're, you're like an 11-year-old child ridiculing this player who has gone through high school, college, he's gone through the minor leagues, he's gone through all the semi-pro, whatever it took to get there, and now he's playing professional sports, and he's in his 10th year of professional sports, and, and, he's, and he's holding on. He's got a batting average. I mean, do you think any, do you think, I, I was going to say any of us, because I don't want to be judgmental and put you all in the same category as me, but do you think if I was playing Major League Baseball, I would even have a batting average? I batted one time in college, I pitched in college, and for a, kind of like a fun thing at the end of a game one time, they, they, they put me in the bat. And again, I never took batting practice, I was a pitcher. And so I went in there, and it was, the dugout, you know, was laughing. Not the other team's dugout, you know, I looked like a ball player. But the, my team was laughing because they knew that Weimers can't hit. Weimers, I've never seen Weimers hold a bat. Now, in high school, I batted, but that was a long time ago. So I'm in there, and it was like, I saw three pitches. And, well, no, no. I heard three pitches. <laughs> and I was like, it's like, where is I? Like, sounds like it was there. And here it comes. And it looked just about like that. And, and, and the pitcher just, at the end, just he threw just a, a just, crazy curveball that just like, oh, and it's like, and the dugout, it was, it was the end of the game, you know, it was, it was, we're just kind of wrapping up, and they needed a pinch hitter, and I went in and just finished up the game, but uh, what was my point for saying that? <laughs> Thank you, I got a laugh from the, the nursery, okay, 
But the point being, I had no business being there. And, I, and it's like, it, okay, I know what I was going to say. If I was in the major league and I hit a foul ball, you understand? All of us, if we were in the major leagues and we're facing major league pitching in a real game and we like fouled off the ball, ticked it, you know, it, it's like, oh, I at least got around and made contact with the ball. I would, I would, I'd, I'd put that on Facebook. I hit a foul ball. I, 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 even if I did that in a, in a slow pitch softball game, I'd probably put it on Facebook. But anyway, my whole point for rambling off that is Paul is up here and he's saying, I don't dare come down here and compare myself. Because now we've got the elite Apostle Paul who's called of God, met Jesus Christ, and is approved by the Jerusalem Council to go to the Gentiles with the gospel message. And they want him to compare himself to the false teachers who have done nothing but come into an organization, mislead them, give them false information for their own advantage, and lead them astray. And you want me to compare myself, you want Paul to compare himself to a reality TV show. I'm not going to do it. One, I'm not going to drop to that level. Two, if I start using my credentials, you won't understand them. This is too far. This is like an 11-year-old evaluating an NBA basketball player. Indeed, the NBA basketball player may not be on a magazine cover, but he's still a lot further ahead than the 11-year-old who's playing seventh grade basketball. Okay. That illustration took a little long. But that's kind of where we're at right here. Chapter 10. Chapter 10, verse 12, we do not dare classify or compare ourselves with some who commend themselves. When they measure themselves by themselves, and you're all down here, measuring themselves by themselves right here, and this is where we ended last week, I'm sorry. It says, they are not wise. They are not wise, which if you look on your notes right there, the word in the Greek right there, number 12, it says, they are not wise, where's that? Oh, it means they lack understanding. In other words, if you are using this world to evaluate God's world, then you just don't get it. If as a Christian, you're down here comparing this Christianity and, and, and ministries at this level, you just don't get it. It's not about what impresses the world. We're up here. It's a completely different center. And it's so high above, the world doesn't understand it. It's so high. I mean, you've got to understand the value of the Word of God. You've got to understand the value of the transformed life. You've got to understand the value of the eternal Creator who became the Savior, who's transforming your life. And if you just have to look at magazine covers and church attendance and buildings and offerings that are going, it's like, you can do all of that without this. In fact, it's going to be easier to do this if you don't have this. If you have this, the world is always going to reject it. And so the false teachers, I got the next bullet point there, false teachers set a false standard of evaluation. Then they praise themselves when they meet the criteria that they, of that false standard. Paul is both defending himself, saying, I'm up here, and also attacking them who are down here. It's, it's, it's pretty clear, I believe. Verse 13, we, however, will not boast beyond the proper limits, but will confine our boasting to the field God assigned to us. Now, he, a field that reaches even to you. Now he's opening up another category here, and I, I've already referred to it. He says, we, will, we, however, will not boast beyond our proper limits. And the proper limits are, what was Paul called to do by God? What was he approved to do by the Jerusalem Council? And what has he historically done? God called him to be an apostle to the Gentiles. The Jerusalem Council recognized that, wrote him a letter. I mean, he's got letters from the highest authorities if you want to say it that way. And then he went to Corinth into a, a pagan culture and started a church. So in other words, I will boast, he says, about what I've done here. But I'm not going to boast about other men's territory. So what he's doing is he's identifying a territory that he has claim to. Now again, he's not afraid of other people coming in and watering the seed, other people coming in and building in the church that he's established. But he is saying... I will boast about what God has done through me. That is, God's called him to be an apostle, and he started a church with the teaching of the Word of God. So that's what he's saying here. Galen? Yes? I get a little confused about Paul. Was, was he more gentle, or was he a bold? You know, before I know before he was saved, he was very bold. But after he become a teacher... Was he more of a gentle personality, or was he still bold? Um, I, I'll answer that, but understand my answer has to be evaluated because, you know, I've never met Paul, you know, and we don't have a, a personal breakdown of him here. Uh, but I do have an opinion on that. 
and I, and I think we can see it in the text of Scripture, is one, Paul's personality, when you get saved, your hair color doesn't change, your skill sets don't change, your personality doesn't necessarily change. You may, you may become more Christ-like, uh, obviously you should, but you, you still have the same, you're the same person. You understand that. So I think Paul, his aggressiveness against the church before he was saved, that, that passion, that drive, that discipline, if you want to call it discipline, uh, didn't disappear. It was just redirected. So I'd be willing to say the same fire, personal fire, that drove Paul to persecute the church is now driving Paul to minister to the church. And so if he was willing to, to ridicule, rip, murder, and again, be careful with murder, kill Christians, he's not afraid now in the Corinthian church for something more severe. And again, he already says our weapons of this warfare are not of this world. He's, he said, I'm going to tear down strongholds. His we he's not going to physically harm or kill anybody, although apparently he had some soldiers in the, in, in, before he said that he was using to kill Christians. Now as a believer, he's not going to be afraid to use arguments. He says, I'll use arguments to pull down everything that sets itself up against God. So I would say Paul is very aggressive against false teachers. He's very bold. He's, he's in some places, I'll even use the word, sometimes comes across as vulgar. In his, when, when he talks to the Galatians, when he talks to the Corinthians, there's things he's saying. It's kind of like, oh my gosh, Paul. We, it's like, yeah, but I'm trying to drive the point home. So Paul is, is very aggressive. Now, at the same time, he begins this chapter. He says, in the meekness and gentleness of Christ. And part of Christ's nature is not to, in God's nature, otherwise our whole world would be different. Our whole religious experience would be different. God is not forcing people to just bow down and worship him. He's not all. You know, I mean, that, that's one of the, the, the that's, that right there discredits for me, discredits Islam as, as a religion. It's not, it, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a political force. It's, it's a, it's, it's a philosophy. It, it's not a religion. God brings you the truth, and because he's created us with free will, every human being, if it be a Muslim, a, a, a Buddhist, a Christian, an atheist, you've got this ability to respond to the creator. And if he just wanted you to just bow down and worship him, he would crush you right now, and you'd all just worship God. Again, that day is coming when every knee will bow. But because of God's nature, because of Jesus Christ, meekness and gentleness, Paul says, by the meekness and gentleness, I come to you the same way. I'm trying to reason with you. I'm trying to put together the illustrations. I'm trying to convince you. I'm pulling down the strongholds in your mind to please understand what's going on here. So he's coming in the meekness and gentleness of Christ of trying to reach people where they're at. Even in chapter, like we said, we read in chapter 11 and 12, he's going to cross the line and go, He's eventually, friends, he's eventually going to say, okay, I see I'm talking to fifth graders here. I'll show you the cover of my magazine. Boom. And he comes out here and starts showing him, whoa, you've gone to heaven. Yes, I've gone to heaven. I, I know this. He says, I've been beaten. I've been put in prison. I've, I've got all kinds of stories that will impress you. It's like, oh, wow, Paul. And then he says, but I've acted like a fool. Let's get back up here. I went down here so you'll come up here. So Paul is very kind. He's very merciful. He's very kind and gentle. He's willing to do whatever it takes to reach people. But when judgment comes, I, I know he's a, he, he called out, look, I mean, he, you know this, in Galatians, he said, I called Peter out. Peter drifted back into the Judaizers. He said, and I was gone. He said, I came back to the church. The church was in chaos. Who put the church of, of Antioch in chaos? The apostle Peter. Because Peter slipped back into Jude. This is after the Caesarea experience. This is after the Jerusalem council. He now is, comes back to church. And Peter, what were you thinking? And he says, even Barnabas, this is in Galatians, even Barnabas was tempted to be led astray by Peter's compromise. He says, well, I come back to the Antioch church. He's in Antioch, which is in Syria. He comes back to the church and says, he says, I had to call Peter. I says, Peter, what are you thinking? And Peter is an apostle of Jesus Christ, and Paul has to ridicule him in front of the church. And it's kind of like, and, and Peter repents. I mean, imagine putting Peter on the spot in front of the Antioch church, which, which is probably a bigger gathering than we have here today, and, and calling him out, and Peter repenting and saying, you're right, Paul, you're right, Paul. So Paul, I think, was very bold, very confident. He could speak to masses of people. He could speak to riots. But yet, he's, again, he's a better man than I am. Because what do you think I, Galen Lemers, would do with the Corinthian church by this time? 
you get one letter, and then I'm deleting your emails, and I'm moving on. That's, that's how far I've developed. Galen Weavers, if you're not going to listen, boom, start deleting you, and I've got other things to do. I, I like to shake the dust off your feet and move on verse. Where Paul, this is his fourth letter. They sent Timothy home crying. They, they're undermining him. He sent Titus over there. And he's trying to, he's the gentleness and meekness of Paul. Please, I'm trying to, what can I say to get you to pay attention? He's trying to save these people. Not just their, their eternal souls, but trying to save their Christian growth. So Paul can be very bold, very aggressive. But yet Paul can be, this right here for me is a demonstration of extreme patience. Galen Weavers would never write a fourth letter to the Corinthians. Not because I'm a better man, it's because I'm a less of a man. It's because I, not because I'm more of a Christian, I'm less of a Christian. I'm less mature than Paul. I would flush this whole church and say, I'm done. Now, I'm not, I'm not saying that's a good thing. I'm just saying that's my attitude. So I see Paul as being very bold, very strong, but very patient, going beyond to a second letter, to a third letter, to a fourth letter, coming and giving them another chance and trying to keep them. So I, I would say he's both, he's very bold, very aggressive, but yet he's like meekness and gentleness of Christ. He's able to do things in the nature of Christ. Uh, so that's a good question. Because you kind of see what Paul's going on here. Now we're going to go on to verse 13. He's after saying, when they measure themselves by themselves and compare themselves with themselves, they are not wise, or they don't understand. Basically, they don't get it. If you're still down here preparing magazine covers and your celebrity ship, you just don't get it. That's what he means. That's what the Greek says. They don't understand. We, however, will not boast beyond proper limits, but will confine our boasting to the field God assigned to us. And what is that field he's assigned? He's an apostle to the Gentiles. He's got the message of the gospel. And that gospel has been approved by the, the Jerusalem council. And Paul did come to Corinth and start the Corinthian church. So the Corinthians, no matter how they like it or not, they are in Paul's field. They are his jurisdiction. Because of God's calling, because of Jerusalem uh, council approval, and because historically he came in and started the church. He says, you are my territory. Uh, but we'll confine our boasting to the field God has assigned to us. A field that reaches even to you. Now the reason he's saying that is he's establishing some kind of territorial rights or jurisdiction or guidelines. We are not going too far in our boasting as would be the case if we had not come to you. For we did get as far as you with the gospel of Christ. He says, we are, I am not exaggerating when I say you are in my field of operation. The reason he's making this an issue is because the false teachers here... The Corinthian church is not in their field of operation. Number one, they are not apostles. Number two, they are not approved by the same Jerusalem council. And three, they came into Paul's church and didn't water Paul's seed or build on Paul's foundation. When I say Paul's seed, I'm saying the word of God or Paul's foundation, which Paul says himself is Jesus Christ. They didn't water the word of God. They didn't build on the foundation of Jesus Christ. They undermined Paul's teaching, which means they ripped out the word of God, they ripped out the foundation of Jesus Christ, and they started teaching something else. They came into his field that was approved by God, confirmed by the apostles, and now, historically, Paul's church. They came in without God's calling, without the approval of the Jerusalem council, and started undermining Paul's work. And so they're operating in a field that's not, they've stolen, in a sense, they've actually stolen the place of leadership in Paul's church. And so that's, a, that's Paul's going to make a big deal about that. Verse 14. We are not going too far in our boasting as would be the case if we had not come to you. And that's what these people that are in the church, they had not come. They just came and took over. For we did get as far as you with the gospel of Christ. Neither do we go beyond our limits by boasting of the work done by others. In other words, we don't go out and start. And I'm going to show you a verse. If you want to go to Romans chapter 15. Paul is very sincere on not undermining other people's work. He'll add to it, he'll, but he's very respectful. He understands the realm of authority. In fact, well, let me just read Romans chapter 15 here. Because even, now again, when he writes Romans, remember when he writes Romans, Romans 15 verse 17. The book of Romans is going to be written from the city of Corinth, in a few months. 
after this letter. What I'm reading to you right now, Paul's writing from Macedonia. He's sending this letter of 2 Corinthians down to Corinth with Titus and two other brothers. When he arrives in Corinth, following that letter up, he's going to meet with the church, and then he's going to write a letter from Corinth to Rome. So what is being written right here is being written within a few months of what he's, he's in Macedonia, and he's going to come to Corinth and write this letter. So this is not like years later. This is like he's in the same, same vein of thinking. Chapter 15, verse 17 of Romans. Therefore I glory in Christ Jesus in my service to God. His service to God is an apostle, starting churches, empowering churches. I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me. Again, he's going to be boasting about what Christ did. Paul's got a calling, and so he realizes anything he does is God working through him. He's just following his commission. I will, not, uh, venture to, uh, I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me in leading the Gentiles, or the heathen, to obey God, which is an amazing feat. You're going into pagan cultures and teaching them about Jesus Christ. By what I have said and done, and I include this, by the power of signs and miracles through the power of the Spirit. So from Jerusalem, this is the verse I'm looking for. So from Jerusalem all the way around to Illyricum. Now Illyricum would be on the other side of the, the peninsula that Philippi or Macedonia is on. Again, I, I've shown you on a map before. But it's on that same peninsula. He's going all the way around to Illyricum. In fact, he could have gone to Illyricum and then come down into Corinth. And that would make sense. That's what he's just, he would have just been there. So from Jerusalem all the way around to Illyricum. Let me say that again. From Jerusalem all the way through Asia, up into Philippi, Thessalonica, Macedonia, over to the other side of the coast, to Illyricum, then down and back into Corinth where he's writing this letter. So from Jerusalem all the way through Asia, up through Macedonia to Illyricum, and then down into Corinth, all the way around to Illyricum, I have fully proclaimed the gospel of Christ. Verse 20. It has always been my ambition to preach the gospel where Christ was not known, so that I would not be building on someone else's foundation. In other words, he says... I am going to the Gentiles to introduce them to Christ, introduce them to the church to, to build the foundation, and then move on. And he's planning on others following him up and teaching on that foundation. So his goal is always to be, and as it says right here, uh, I have always made it my ambition to preach the gospel where Christ was not known, so that I would not be building on someone else's foundation. Rather, it is written, those who were not told about him will see, and those who have not heard will understand. He's using that Old Testament verse as a motivation for his ministry. I'm going to go places where they know nothing of Jewish culture, they know nothing of the Messiah, and I'm going to introduce him through the power of the Spirit, through signs and wonders, through the teaching of the Word of God, I'm going to lay a foundation. Paul does not want to run around and go through all of John's churches and all the other apostles' churches and try to get them to you know, take up an offering to support him. Although in Rome, again, stay with me, please, the Roman church is already established. You understand? Paul is not going to establish the Roman church. This is unique. When he writes to the Galatians, he's writing to a church that he was a teacher in. When he writes to the Corinthians or the Thessalonians, he's writing to a church that he started and get back in line. He's getting them back in line. When he writes to the church of Rome, he's not writing as an apostle who started the church. He's writing to a church that is up and running and functioning and is saying to them right here, he's writing a great letter, but he's basically saying, I want to come. Here's what I believe I want to come. Go to chapter 1. Here's what he's saying to the, Corinth, the Roman church which is in line with his ideal of working together. He is not against working together, different ministries and apostles and churches working together. Look at Rome. He has never been to Rome. So Paul does not have, in a sense, any territorial rights in Rome. He's only got a spiritual gift that he's willing to share with them. And notice what he says in chapter 1, verse 11. And we can go through, we will eventually here go through this. Chapter 11, Romans chapter 1, verse 11. He tells the Romans, again, a church that he's never been to, but he, again, he knows a lot of people that have gone to that church, coming out of Corinth and other places, and a lot of people from that church that have come to see him in Ephesus or Corinth or Macedonia. And you can see that in the last chapter, there's this list of references of names that he knows people. Chapter 1, verse 11. I long to see you. Why? So that I may impart to you some spiritual gift. 
Now, again, not again. He's an apostle, but he's going. I'm coming not as an apostle to start the church, but I'm going to come with the spiritual. But watch the humbleness of this. I long to see you so that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to make you strong. That is, that you and I may mutually may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. In other words, he says you're up and running. I'm not coming to correct you. I'm coming to share with you my spiritual gift so I can build you up, encourage you. But he said, what I mean is, I'll be strengthened by you also. We're going to, and again, he sees the body, that's right out of 1 Corinthians. The body of Christ, we strengthen each other. We, we feed each other. We help each other. We got different gifts. And Paul says, when I come, I'm going to be able to contribute something to you, but I know when I get there, you're going to contribute something to me. And eventually he's going to ask for an offering to keep him on his journey. But it's, it's more than that. It's more than the money side of it, obviously. Okay, let's go back to uh, 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 2 Corinthians or chapter 10. I want to finish this chapter, so let me see where I'm at for time. Yep, time to start circling the airplane. Here we go. Chapter 10, verse 14. We are not going too far in our boasting, as would be the case if we had not come to you. In other words, I'm boasting, saying I have authority over this church, and these false teachers are undermining you. And I'm not pushing it because, he says, we started the church. The false teachers are pushing it because they're undermining us. Verse 50, neither do we go beyond our limits by boasting of work done by others. Now, this is a direct, ac or not direct, it's an indirect accusation of the false teachers. He says, for example, neither do we go beyond our limits by boasting of work done by others. In other words, I am not coming to you trying to make you listen to me and someone else actually started you. I'm the one who started the church and someone else is coming in trying to get you to follow them. It's the false teachers who are actually doing this, going beyond boasting about their work done by themselves. And they didn't do anything except come in and try and take over in Paul's absence. Our hope is that as your faith continues to grow, our area of activity among you will greatly expand so that we can preach the gospel in regions beyond you. So what he wants them to, he said, if you follow these false teachers, we're, we're dead in the water. Nothing's going to happen. They're leading, misleading you. He says, I want you to come back and follow me so that this can be, Corinth can be a base of operation so we can spring off and go to other areas of Achaia. Paul can follow, they can, just like what happens in Ephesus. Paul wrote the letter to the Colossians from prison, but Paul had never been to Colossae. He said, even later, he said, I've never met you. But Colossians is right there by Ephesus, like Laodicea. Paul had never been there. How did the church get started? While Paul was in Ephesus, people went out, it tells you in the text, someone went over and, from Paul's ministry went over and started the church of Colossae. So Paul is going to use Corinth like he used Ephesus. It's a center. He builds the ministry, and then that branches off, and all of Asia, it says, heard the gospel. Why? Because of Paul's work in Ephesus. Paul wants the same thing to take place in Achaia. The whole province is going to hear because Paul was in Corinth. But if he doesn't get the Corinthian church back in track, all kinds of garbage is going to spin out of that Corinthian church. I'll use this example, and please forgive me if it's offensive. But in it's an article come out yesterday. We've, we've known this for a long time. But Europe, of course, is dwindling in Christianity. It's being overrun. I mean, not just because of the events of the last couple of months, but because of the last several decades. They did it to themselves. And now they're being overrun. So by 2020, uh, the, the, I can't remember the number, but the, the highest percentage, I think, in Africa, I, I shouldn't say this without having actual numbers, but uh, Africa is going to become predominantly Christian. I mean, we got the Muslim problem on the north side, but predominantly Christian in Africa. And that's, it, Christianity is shrinking in Europe, the Western world, in America, we've got our own problems, but Africa is growing in Christianity. And, and it's, it's going to become, the even in magazines like Christianity Today and other places, in, over the last several years, they're saying, Europe wrote the theology for what we read, like what we accept as theology, correct theology, that came out of Europe in the 15th, 16th, 1700s. They kind, of, they kind of drove, the liberal movement came out of Germany in the 1800s and stuff, if you understand what I'm saying. They kind of drove theology coming out of Europe. America's had our place. Be careful, I'll address that in just a moment. But in the next century, if the Lord tarries, which we, we don't know when the Lord is coming back, the theology of Christianity is going to be African-driven. 
I mean, they're going to be the ones, they're not going to forget Augustine, they're not going to forget about Martin Luther, they're not going to forget about other things, but they will begin writing and evaluating theology from their perspective, and it's going to have world impact. So with Africa growing, and these different articles being put together, the concern is, as you can see right here, Paul wanting to save Corinth, get them back on track, because he wants to use that as an outreach to all of Achaia, just like he used Ephesus as an outreach to all of Asia is it is so important that Africa has correct theology or has the Bible. Because when I get letters, emails, and, I, and, and interaction with, there's a, there's a force over there. Yeah, they've got issues with Islam. But there's another, and this is where this is the offensive part. There's a force over there that they're, they're, they're biting hook and sinker. How do you say that? Hook, line, and sinker. They're, they're swallowing it whole. It's, it's, it's the Benny Hinn charismatic word of faith, get rich quick. It's like, and they, they, they think, they, when they hear Christianity and they see my material, they think we're going to match at some point. And it's kind of like, no, no. This, the sad, one of the sad things is you've got Augustine adding to theology in the 480. You've got Martin Luther adding to theology, you know, in the 15, 1600s. You've got America adding to theology in the 1900s, the 21st century, what are we adding? The prosperity message, the personal experience. We've got a personal experience with the Lord. We've got a personal experience with the Spirit of God. We've got a personal financial blessing from God. It's like, it's all about me. And it's kind of like, understand, that's, that's a very radical, different theology than sometimes you see. And again, we, we do see that love relation between the father and his child, Jesus and his church. I'll take care of you. But it, 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 it's not what we're making it out to be. And that is, as, as Africa is becoming more and more Christian, guys like Benny Hinn and Joyce Myers and all these people, they want, that preach is easier. That is always going to preach easier if you, if, if you promise people worldly things and then you come in and they call it Christianity. And I, I'm saying, I'm venturing to say, it's not. And it's a, it's a, it's, it's a concern because if Africa is going to be one of the leaders in Christianity in the next century or so, it'd be really nice if they were starting here with their theology and not with Benny Hinn's latest book or Joel Olstein's latest book or whatever. Not that these are bad people, but they are definitely not teaching the full scripture as far as the message. Because in the end, we die and Jesus comes back and resurrects us. You understand? We die in the end. It's not like, well, in the end, well, I've read the last page. Jesus comes back. Yeah, but did you read the pages in between? We die. We suffer. We're martyred. We're persecuted. We're rejected. We're like, we're like sheep going to our deaths. But we're being put on display that we've got a power greater than the natural. We've got a power inside. It's the power of the resurrected life, which means you're going to die and be raised. We win in the end. But the game's not even close to being over, folks. And so this bad teaching that we have right now in our culture, is, is we're missing the point. And we're, we're pumping that into other countries. You talk about bad movies, talk about bad morals, all those things, bad food, you know, McDonald's or whatever you want to be, that America's pumping into other countries, yeah, whatever. My concern is we're pumping bad theology into Africa and other places that... We're not really, at, we're not promoting Christ. We're promoting the Western version of theology. Okay, and Paul, there's an application of this verse right here. Verse 50, neither do we go beyond our limits, but by boasting of work done by others, our hope is that as your faith continues to grow, our area of activity among you will greatly expand so that we can preach the gospel in the regions beyond you. So any outreach we have in Africa should be to expand correct theology beyond the people we've reached. Not let Benny Hinn take over. For we do not want to boast about the work already done by another man's territory. Verse 17. But let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. In other words, Paul says we're not going to boast about what we've done, but we are going to boast about what the Lord has done in the field we've assigned. And in other words, Paul says, I am boasting. But it's not about me, it's about what God, God called me to be an apostle, the apostles approved me to be an apostle, and now I've come to you and you are a church. 
He says, that's the Lord. I'm boasting what the Lord has done with me, who used to be a persecutor of the church. Let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. For it is not the one who commends himself. In other words, at the end of the day, Paul says, I'm up here doing what the Lord, I, I, I've done this. But he says, that's what the Lord called me to do, empowered me to do. So I'm, when I boast about what I've done, it's just what the Lord has empowered me to do. Then he says this, we drop back down here. For it is not the one who commends himself, right here, it's not the one who commends himself who is approved, but the one whom the Lord commands. In the end, it doesn't matter what you think. It doesn't matter what the world thinks. It puts you on the magazine cover. In the end, it's what the Lord, the Lord, Paul says, Paul's fully confident. The Lord has called me to do this. I boast about what I've done because it's the Lord. And in the end, the Lord will commend me for what I've done because of what the Lord did through my life, my ministry. He says down here, they're commending themselves, but in the end, when the Lord commends them, it's like, yeah, this is, we forgot you as fast as we forgot the most influential people of 2014. It's like, who were they? I don't know. We got new celebrities now. And they'll be gone by 2020. Okay. That's the end of chapter 10. Paul now in verse 11. It's a good place to switch. Because now once he's established this, I'm up here. You're down here. Again, Don asks, what kind of person was he? Right there, I would close the book and says, you losers, good luck. And walk away. But Paul's like, I'll take one more shot. I hope you'll put up with a little of my foolishness. I'm gonna, everything I've just said, I'm going to go the other way. I know I'm up here, and you guys are down to look at magazine covers. I'm going to come down here. I'll, 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 meet you, I'll meet you at the fifth grade level. He says, but you are all right. says, I hope you'll put up a little of my foolishness, but you're already doing that. I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy. So what's driving right now in this foolishness is not self-promotion. It's not a bigger offering. It's, he says, I feel God's jealousy, his desire for this church so I've got to come down here and somehow make one more effort to speak to you at your level. I'm jealous for you for God with a godly jealousy. I promise you to what I promise you to one husband to Christ, so that I might present you as a pure virgin to him. But I'm afraid just as Eve was deceived, now he's talking about the false seeds deceiving him. And so now he goes on, he's gonna end up in the sixth chapter, he says, Okay, I'm afraid you've been deceived. So I'm gonna to come down and try to impress you. Say, I can outdo this criteria, this 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 man-made criteria, I will blow it away. I'll tell you about a man who's gone to heaven. I'll tell you about a man who's seen these things. And he goes on and it's like, and then when they get it done, they're all like, oh, Paul, I wish we would have known you're going to speak on this, this today because we would have invited a whole lot of people. They would have loved to have heard this. I know a bunch of pagans would love to hear this. But anyway, you understand what I'm saying right here. He's going to drop down at this level to try and get them to pay attention to him and tell, to show them, I can throw a fastball past these fifth graders. The fifth graders maybe make it fun of my baseball card. But if the fifth graders want me to come throw batting practice in their PE class, I'll, I'll strike every one of them out. So they're saying, oh, Paul, he's no good. He doesn't meet our criteria. He's no good. Paul says, I'll come down and play in your PE class, and I'll show you who's going to. Paul's basically going to a fifth grade PE class and throwing batting practice. And they're like, whoa. Yeah, now I'm going to go back to the big leagues. Stop making fun of me. Okay, if that makes sense at all, I hope that makes sense. We'll pick that up next week. I appreciate your patience and your understanding. Father, we do come to you today in the name of Jesus. We do thank you so much for the truth that you presented to us. We ask that we would hold to the gospel, that we would hold to the word of God, that we'd be able to separate ourselves from the thinking of the world and be able to embrace the truth and understand the truth, that we may be able to be part of the outreach to a world that is desperate for answers, desperate for direction. Father, we ask that we ourselves would be able to, to maintain a, a stability in our own lives and in our families' lives, that we can see the truth, walk in the truth. And Father, we ask that we may serve you throughout our lifetime. And we do look forward to the resurrection when we do win in the end because you have won the battle, and we ask that we may be standing with you in victory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for, again for your patience.